Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good evening, whatever you are. Uh, welcome to today's um, discussion on the Asia Olympics. Uh, my name is George Sirimis. I am the director of the Hellenic Studies Program. And this event is done in collaboration with the Council on East European, uh, I'm sorry, East Asian uh, Studies at uh, the Macmillan Center uh, at Yale University. Our first collaboration, and I hope not the last, um, it's wonderful to be having this event uh, with another uh, uh, sister entity in the center. Uh, I'll just say a couple of things about how we will be running the um, uh, webinar today. Uh, we will have the chat function open, but um, I personally am not promising that I will be responding to any of the chats because I'd like to pay attention to the speakers. Uh, we will also be having uh, the Q&A uh, function open, which you can uh, submit your questions there and we will get to them at the end of um, the presentations. Um, I will give us a brief um, introduction to the topic and then I will present uh, the first speaker. The sequence of um, the speakers today will not be the same as in the poster. Um, we will have first um, um, uh, William uh, Kelly uh, give the first presentation, then followed by John Horn, and then by uh, Susan uh, Branwell at the end. Uh, we're going chronologically according to the topics. So um, what is the excuse of this panel is uh, we've been discussing this uh, before we opened up the forum. Um, well, the obvious one is the, um, the trouble with the Tokyo Olympics uh, of last year that didn't happen and the Tokyo Olympics of this year that uh, uh, look like they might happen. Um, this is also somewhat in the context of a class I teach on the Olympics and uh, we're getting towards uh, the end of the semester and uh, students are looking for paper topics. So I thought what a wonderful idea to also invite them to a panel with three world specialists on the topic. Um, now, the history of uh, uh, Asia in the Olympics uh, starts uh, from uh, almost the very beginning. Japan joins in 1912. Um, already after 1894, um, Japan is building its empire that will soon include Taiwan, Korea, Manchuria, and parts of uh, Northern China. So according to Coubertin, uh, once you have an empire, you count as um, uh, a civilized nation, as opposed to the primitives that were not invited to the Olympics. Um, South Korea joined in 1948. Uh, China has a different kind of history because uh, of its uh, uh, participation in 1924 as the Republic of China, and later on from 1952 as the People's Republic of China. Now, there's something exceptional about these particular countries in that uh, they're the only Asian countries to have hosted the Olympics. And there are uh, also countries that have hosted the Olympics more than once. Um, if you have been following Olympic uh, history in the last uh, 50 years, uh, uh, you could not fail but notice the, the meteoric ascent of these three nations. Uh, they've become powerhouses in the world athletics. Um, and uh, they have hosted the Olympics uh, numerous times. Um, Japan, in fact, has hosted them uh, four times uh, since 1964. The only other country that has hosted more is the United States with five Olympics. South Korea went from uh, zero medals in 1960 to 38 in the last Summer Olympics and Winter Games. While China, the newest Olympic member of the three, uh, still enjoys this ascent a controversial ascent um, and currently ranks fifth in terms of average medals per Olympia. So with this um, impressive record and the upcoming two Olympiads in Tokyo and Beijing in mind, we thought we would bring this discussion um, to our audience and um, revisit this topic. What do the Olympics mean for a particular country? We're also at a very peculiar moment in the Olympic history having to do with the pandemic uh, we have been um, discussing in class an ancient uh, text by Lucian where um, Lucian stages a dialogue between Solon and this uh, barbarian wise man called Anaharsis, where Anaharsis makes fun of all the, um, the tokens of uh, victory in the Olympics, you know, the 
wreath of olive leaves, a wreath of, um, of um, laurel at the Pythian Games, and uh, a wreath of wild um, celery. Uh, no offense to uh, regular celery. Um, that is given, I think, in the Nemean Games. And uh, Solon, uh, despite his wisdom, is having trouble uh, explaining the Olympic allure to Anharsis. And in the end, uh, basically gives up and says to him, man, you got to be there to understand what I'm talking about. And sadly, this year, uh, we cannot be there, which, of course, that's a kind of different dimension. Who are the games for? What is the role of TV broadcast, which seems to be um, uh, most of the, where most of the income of the Olympic Committee comes from uh, these days, and uh, surely drives part of the impetus to hold uh, the Olympics this summer. Um, that was sort of my brief introduction to the topic. I would like to present uh, first um, uh, William Kelly, uh, who will be our first speaker. Um, Bill Kelly, as he's also known, is, uh, I guess, our local uh, guest uh, here from New Haven. He is professor of anthropology and the Sumitomo professor of Japanese studies um, here at the anthropology department. Uh, he is also the chair of the department and has served as chair not only of that department uh, in the past, but also of the Council of East Asian Studies, which sponsors this event. Uh, much of his in, uh, research in the past two decades has uh, focused on sports and body culture and their significance in modern Japan. Um, he has published in English and in Japanese on these uh, particular topics, and is now finishing a new, a new book on the Kansai clubs, the, the Hanshing Tigers, uh, entitled The Hanshing Tigers and the Practices of Professional Baseball in Modern Japan. Um, I think you also have a, uh, an article or another on the stadium, in, on the baseball stadium in Japan, uh, Bill, if I remember correctly. Um, his research uh, also has uh, broadened uh, out to um, cover the growing influence of soccer and the, and the way that the Olympic movement is reshaping notions of ethnicity, gender, and citizenship in Japan and East Asia. He has edited and contributed to uh, four of the main uh, uh, and most uh, important um, uh, books on the sports culture and Olympic culture, particularly in Asia and Japan, and I will, uh, I will ask for uh, the forgiveness of all of the panelists that I won't be listing all of your uh, great publications and only a selected few. So I'll mention the four that I, are more, more pertinent to our topic today. Fanning the Flames, Fandoms and Consumer Culture in Contemporary Japan, This Sporting <laughs> Life, Sports and the Body Culture in Modern Japan, The Olympics in East Asia, the crucible of localism, nationalism, regionalism, and globalism. And last, the new geopolitics of sports in East Asia, uh, which um, is the last one I will mention, Bill, and you have the floor. Okay. But, uh, and thank you so much for, um, may I mention one more thing about the constitution of this panel? Because mm -hmm. I think as, um, as academics who are prone to, uh, complain and whine about the politics and the hierarchies of, of, the, of the field and, uh, and of uh, generally academia, but it was so sweet to realize from the second emails I got from each one of you that you are actually a group of friends uh, that are quite amicable and respectful and, um, and happy to be joining this uh, panel uh, also as, uh, as uh, friends. So I'm uh, specifically happy for that reason as well. So you go off with the, the floor and we'll, uh, I'll present uh, John afterwards. Uh, excuse me. The, uh, I'll move that bar so I 
there. Let me move my bar out of the way. All right. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction and for the invitation. All three of us are delighted to come together um, as friends and fellow scholars of the Olympics uh, for this uh, webinar. Um, we talked amongst ourselves and figured out an order that's roughly chronological. I'm going to talk first and uh, focus primarily on juxtaposing Tokyo 64 and Tokyo 2020, just to bring us up to uh, what may or may not happen um, in 95 days from now. Um, and then Professor John Horn is going to focus, especially on probably the most important question this year, um, the pros and cons, whether or not um, the uh, Olympic Games uh, will or should go on. And then uh, Professor Susan Brownell um, will take up the question for the future, China 2022, uh, the possible boycotts and protests in the larger context of Olympic history, um, which has had its share of protests and controversies and uh, boycotts. Um, we understand there are really two audiences uh, today. Uh, there is a seminar um, of Yale students who have been focusing on the Olympics uh, this semester, and we're very excited about that. Um, and we're also pleased that it's open to a larger audience um, at Yale um, and around the world. So there may be some range of interests and expertise in the subject, but we hope that all three of us um, can address um, the, the interests and the enthusiasms that you may have uh, for these Olympic Games, for the Olympic Games in Asia, although I suppose more precisely we should say East Asia, because it's the three East Asian nations of Japan um, and China and, and uh, South Korea um, that have collectively hosted um, the eight uh, Winter and Summer Olympics from 1964, uh, looking ahead to 2022. Um, there are many fascinating, distinctive features about the Olympics that those of you in the seminar um, have certainly discovered in the course of your readings and discussions. Um, one of them is that the Olympics rather metonymically represent um, a quality of sports, organized sports more generally. That is, sports are among the most hard-framed, hard-wired, rule-governed uh, pursuits um, that humans are involved in. Um, on the other hand, every time sports are actually perform, sports are actually done, um, what happens is entirely uh, open-ended and unpredicted. And this tension between the rule-governed um, hard frame of sports um, and the actual actions and activities in suspense of sports um, is sort of represented in the Olympics themselves, um, very tightly managed and administered um, and rule-governed, and yet every Olympics um, is different from that which came before and that which comes afterwards. It's germane to uh, what I want to present to you uh, today in my, my 20 minutes, because in many respects for the last 15 years, um, the promoters, the planners, the politicians behind Tokyo's bid in 2020 have consistently and nostalgically um, tried to recall um, the glory of the summer games that took place in Tokyo in 1964, and to what extent they can restore and resuscitate and revive and play off of um, the spirit of 1964 has been central to the enthusiasm that they've, been, they've tried to generate. Um, question is how well they're able to do that, how, how, uh, how successfully they can recall and revive and, and replay um, the events of Tokyo 64. Actually, as you might have discovered in, in, in the seminar, um, the circumstances surrounding each Olympics um, varies widely. The historical circumstances, the geopolitical context, the domestic situation. I um, mean, that's certainly true in the case of thinking about Tokyo 64 and Tokyo 2020 um, together. There are many things about the Tokyo 64, probably after the Berlin Hitler Olympics of 1936, 
um, in 20th century Olympic history, the Tokyo 64 Summer Games have been the most discussed, the most written about, the most uh, focused on. Um, it was perhaps not the unalloyed success that um, uh, many of the Japanese felt, but it was certainly one of the most transformational um, Olympics for um, the host city, the host country, um, and the Olympic movement itself. Just to pull out um, what I think are five of the key legacies um, of the Tokyo 64 Games, then we start with the opening ceremony themselves. The opening ceremonies have been used by um, Olympic cities over and over to uh, uh, pursue certain agendas and imaging and branding. And certainly that was the case in 1964, especially um, in the political theme of trying to, to sanitize and domesticate um, a Japanese polity that was still under suspicion in the world. It was the same emperor that led them to war in the 1930s and 1940s. The emperor, who was not actually head of state, nonetheless, through careful negotiation, was allowed to preside and open the games. Um, the, the five uh, 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 um, aerial uh, uh, Olympic rings um, were being drawn by the the Air Force Self-Defense Forces. Japan was not to have a military, but it had a self-defense force. And looking up into the sky, they could see that. The Sacred Runner um, was born in Hiroshima the day that the, the, the atomic bomb was dropped. Um, the foreign media were quite enchanted by the opening ceremonies and everything else. And through Life magazine and other things, proceeded to present the emperor in this kind of middle-class domesticated way. In many ways then, what happened um, in, the, uh, in the opening ceremony and throughout the games was to normalize um, a sense of, of nationalism from the militant, the military nationalism um, of the immediate uh, war to a more normal um, a political uh, nationalism. Second thing was, and again, every host city is trying to use the games um, for infrastructural improvements and to push agendas that it might not otherwise be able to get across. But Tokyo underwent a, 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 an infrastructural transformation that is quite remarkable even in, uh, in Olympic history. Skyscrapers were put up for, this, for the first time, highways, subways, railroads, um, new sanitation system, the, 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 the label of, of the city before the games was Saitoshi, smelly city, um, and one wag uh, uh, noted the games really brought Tokyo from Sai City, Smelly City, to Kokusai City, International City, um, through all of these improvements that were pushed through in the five or six years leading up to 64. And of course, um, it was the bullet train, the so-called Shinkansen, um, that was built, put into service just uh, 10 days before the opening of the games that really symbolized um, Tokyo is presenting itself to the world um, as this new modern uh, city with all of the amenities um, of the Western capitals um, to, 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 to which it looked. Um, it was not just a matter of economics and politics. It was also cultural. Um, the Tokyo 64 Games introduced to the world a new generation of Japanese architects becoming star architects uh, who were fully conversant with the international style modernism um, of the, uh, the, 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 the Western um, architectural boom, but was bringing to that um, a very distinctive Japanese sensibility. And so again, all of these games feature the ceremonial architecture um, of the games, but Tokyo 64 had these amazing buildings, as I say, that, that so deftly blended um, the modernism um, with a, a, a Japanese aestheticism, the Budokan, the martial arts um, a building, uh, the National Gymnasium. Um, a, a, a tange came to, if, if we were doing this in person, we would be 200 yards from the Yale Whale, the Yale uh, Bowl, the Yale Ice Skating. A, a tange came to um, Engels Rink, stood there, and was deeply impressed and took many of the, de the design elements um, from the Ingalls rink um, and put it into the Yogi National Gymnasium. But it, it, it catapulted um, a whole generation of Japanese um, architects um, onto the international scene. And it wasn't just monumental architecture, it was aesthetics in all sorts of ways. It was the first place with a non-Western language. And so doing pictograms to, to guide the foreign 
um, non-Japanese speaking um, uh, 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 spectators around the city and around the venues became quite important. Um, and the whole notion of graphic design and the importance of graphic design was really stamped um, with the Tokyo with the Tokyo Olympics in the pictograms in the in the poster art. Um, the wonderful Tokyo Olympia documentary um, that was produced very soon after um, by Ishikawa Kong. Um, the, the poet was also trying to re-educate the, 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 the Tokyo citizenry to provide the hospitality um, necessary. To uh, Tokyo taxi drivers were told not to honk their horns. Uh, the yakuza and gangsters were told to leave town. Um, there was to be no spitting and urinating in public places. It was a whole campaign. Um, that was designed to, um, uh, to, to, to teach um, and socialize um, the residents um, into um, being proper uh, 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 hosts um, of this game. Um, if there was one gold medal among the medals that the Japanese took um, that meant the most to the Japanese national audience, it was probably the gold medal that was taken by uh, the Japanese women's volleyball, volleyball team, the so-called witches um, of, of the Orient. Um, they were world champions. They had beat uh, the Soviet team um, in Moscow in 1962, but for six years leading up to the games, um, the training, the selection, the training of this team um, was 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 um, pub publicized by uh, state television and by media. There was so much writing um, on this team and its potential success um, that, in fact, it did take it did take the gold medal. What was underlying though, the backstory um, of that was not just the Cold War dynamics of, the, of, of Japan aligning itself with the West, beating the Soviets um, at this sport, but this was a, this was a women's volleyball team um, in an era when tens of thousands of junior high school graduates, uh, boys and girls, um, were recruited in groups brought by group train to Tokyo and the major metropolitan areas to work in this new um, dynamic manufacturing um, and office um, economy that was beginning to boom in the, in the 1960s. Um, this team was drawn from um, one of the leading corporate volleyball teams um, and sort of represented this new wave of youth education, youth employment, youth migration to the cities and the abilities um, of these corporations to, to, to take care um, of their young female employees, to provide them with the recreation and the discipline necessary to reassure um, a regional um, a, a parenthood um, that this style of economic vitalization um, through this youth migration um, was successful. So in all sorts of ways, um, it had enormous sort of, uh, domestic uh, significance that was largely lost on uh, the, foreign, uh, the foreign audience. And finally, um, Tokyo 64 was not the first time um, that a Paralympics um, immediately followed the Olympic Games themselves. That had happened once before. It was the first time that games for disabled athletes were called Paralympics. Um, and again, the domestic story was somewhat lost on, by then, the very sparse uh, foreign audience. Um, the disabled in Japanese society were primarily um, the disabled soldiers that were brought back. Um, there was no VA uh, system to take care of them. Um, they were prominent um, in the cities um, without um, assisted, without public assistance, begging. Um, and there was a concern even by members of the Royal, the, the, the Crown Prince. Um, was very concerned about this, very concerned about Japanese attitudes and discrimination towards um, the disabled and saw um, the Paralympics and making something of the Paralympics a way by which um, the Japanese could be educated to a very different view um, of what, dis what disability um, could and, and, and could not I mean. So the, the Paralympic Games were very important um, in setting in motion a rethinking about disability in Japanese society, but also within the IOC it was from Tokyo 64 onward um, that the Paralympics gradually became absorbed um, into as a correlative uh, 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 organization within the, within the IOC um, and Tokyo 2020, um, uh, if and when it happens, uh, will be um, an even closer um, uh, 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 connection between the Olympic and the, and the Paralympic movement. 
So I said, there are lots of ways in which um, by these features and others, um, Tokyo 64 was transformational for the city. It was transformational for Japan. It was transformational for the Olympic movement itself, um, which opened itself up much more readily after Tokyo 64 um, to Asian participation, East Asian participation, East Asian um, hosting or Japan with the Winter Olympics and then Seoul and then Beijing and now Tokyo um, again. The question, as I said at the beginning, is to what extent um, those who started, you know, Tokyo 2020 may or may not happen in 95 days, but the Tokyo 2020 Olympics really began 15 years. It's been going on for 15 years um, since uh, the, the, the Tokyo metropolitan politicians and business centers started lobbying um, in their bid for the 2016 Olympics. Um, they lost out to Rio de Janeiro, but they immediately um, mobilized, um, shifted their attention, and eventually were successful in gaining the, 20, in the 2020 bid. But this is a process, at least at the level um, of Tokyo and Japan, um, that began roughly in 2004, 2005, and by a generation um, who had been youth in 1964. So this is very much nostalgically in the minds of um, the organizers of, of 2020, and they really sought to, to, to recreate as best they could um, that spirit, um, uh, that, that, that success. Um, the point is that things have changed remarkably um, in the decades um, since then um, in ways that um, perhaps are less acknowledged um, by the boosters um, on, on the organizing committee. 1964, the international others um, of Japan in, in hosting and presenting the Olympics um, were the Western countries that had been um, their enemies um, 15 years before. Um, they were trying to rejoin an international order um, and reimagine themselves um, as a so-called normal nation. The international others in 2020 really not um, that as an audience, it's their fellow East Asian nations that now are embroiled in intense um, rivalries. Um, what's gone on really since uh, 64 or Seoul in, in 88, it's sort of like the, 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 the rival potlatches that were thrown by um, the various uh, chiefs of the Kwakutl Indians to try to out uh, to, to outbid and out prestige um, their rivals. Um, the Tokyo hosting the games has become in East Asia um, a preeminent act of set of soft power um, arrivalry in the context um, of actual uh, tensions that have been rising um, every year. Uh, between South Korea and Japan, between North Korea and South Korea and Japan, between China and Japan, um, China's repressions in Hong Kong with the Uyghurs, in all sorts of ways, um, the Olympics have become um, a, a, a platform um, for, uh, for, for litigating um, the rivalries um, of, uh, the East, of the East Asian, of the East Asian nations. Actually that, I mean, George Orwell is smart about many things, but I guess, he didn't realize that um, there is the biathlon um, in the Olympics. So actually it's not war minus the shooting, it's war uh, including uh, the shooting um, in the Olympics. Um, but there's a, a second level to the agendas of 2020 that were um, absent in 1964. As I say, at the international level, it's the East Asian geopolitics and the rivalries of soft power. Um, at the national level, of course, the Olympics uh, have been framed by um, the disasters in 2011, the tsunami and the nuclear power uh, 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 meltdown. Um, when they were bidding for 2016, that hadn't happened. Uh, but when they were bidding for 2020, it had just happened. And so this decade from 1910 to, to, to from 2010 to 2020 has really been a decade of, of, of torn between um, recovery um, uh, from uh, the disasters in Tohoku in the Northeast outside of Tokyo um, and the efforts to use 2020 um, to, to, to rebuild and reconstruct. And the, the debates and the struggles and the controversies have been whether the Olympics, which will end up in fact um, investing some 90 to 95% of its budget um, in metropolitan Tokyo have anything to do with 
um, the responsibilities that the national government uh, still have uh, towards um, the Tohoku region, um, for which there has been only partial um, reconstruction and renewal and, 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 and renovation. Tokyo, as you can see um, from this chart, um, is the most concentrated, most populous metropolitan center um, of any of the OECD countries. Um, there's a much greater national percentage of the national population in Tokyo than in European capitals um, or New York. It is, it is hyper concentrated. And the debates, the controversies, and certainly before COVID, most of the resistance um, that many Japanese felt to the Olympics was the effects of 2020 will simply be um, to further hyper-concentrate an already overly concentrated uh, metropolitan region. So at the national level, um, the arguments to and for the games over the last decade uh, following uh, the, the, the 311 tsunami uh, has been um, the effects that this is going to have um, on further uh, uh, widening the disparities between Tokyo um, and, the and the rest of the country. But within Tokyo itself, um, there's a third sort of level of, uh, of agendas because Tokyo itself um, has been for some time quite anxious about its own standing, not within Japan, but in the uh, wider uh, uh, contrast set um, of so-called global cities. Uh, the global cities have their own sort of U.S. News and World Report um, about uh, about status, and Tokyo has sat rather uncomfortably in number four position um, for uh, for a decade or so. But it constantly worries um, that it's under a threat um, by other Asian mega cities that are coming up, or by its inability to get beyond. Um, a few uh, key strengths. It just doesn't have the amenities. It doesn't have the, the sort of the cultural prestige. Um, and so it sees the Olympics, not for Japan, but for itself, um, as a way of trying to address um, these, the, the, these anxieties. Um, and in all sorts of ways, um, it has tried to, uh, to win over um, the, the metropolitan population um, with not the kind of, of massive infrastructure, engineering infrastructure of 64, but with other ways um, in which the city can become much more um, user-friendly and foreigner-friendly um, than, than it has been in all sorts of ways. If you've been to Tokyo, um, it's a wonderful city to, to visit and live in, but it has very significant uh, qualities um, that um, uh, rightfully leave um, its, uh, its leaders feeling that it, it's it's slipping in any sort of, of thinking about uh, global global cities. So basically, uh, I, you know, what I want to suggest here at the outset are the ways in which, in broad terms, um, the Olympics are used by cities and countries and movement itself um, for certain sort of predictable agendas. But the particular agendas um, in 1964 and, and in 2020 are are extremely different given the geopolitics, um, the historical moment, um, and the place that um, uh, the, the Tokyo the, the occupies um, within the country itself. Now, of course, academic nuance usually gets lost um, when the Olympics come around and the public is much more focused um, on matters of controversy and certainly the run-up to the 2020 games has featured um, the usual uh, amount of controversies about uh, the budget, about, um, as I said, the diversion of funds from Tohoku, um, about the plagiarism of the designs, about the, the controversy over the national uh, a stadium that was taken from uh, uh, Zaha Hadid and given to a Japanese uh, a star architect about the insistence on putting, it on, on putting on the Olympics in the middle of intense heat and, and humidity. Um, the recent, um, it wasn't, the sexism is not recent, but the publicization of the sexism. Um, and of course, overshadowing all of them um, is the question of the pandemic and Japan's surprisingly mixed, even 
weak, anemic response to uh, the pandemic, initially successful um, with its masking and, 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 and public separation, but very slow in its vaccination campaign and whether these sorts of factors um, will turn Tokyo 2020 uh, into a, a follower of Tokyo 64, it will actually happen and, and be able to pursue its agendas, or whether this is going to be a repeat of Tokyo uh, 1940 that was canceled uh, because of the, the Pacific War um, in, in, in 1939. Um, I have some thoughts on that, but uh, it's actually uh, my colleague, uh, Professor John Horn, um, who can take up these issues um, with uh, uh, considerable depth um, and to whom I would like to uh, yield uh, the screen time. Thank you very much. Sorry, guys. There we go. Okay, uh, shall I just uh, carry on, George? Um, you go ahead, John, and I will present you after you get done, if that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry for my- No, you, you, I'm so okay. please I, uh, do the now, yes. intro. Actually, let's do it now in case I do lose connection again. Uh, I'm trying to, um, if you could unshare so that I can access my notes as well. I apologize, I'm working today between the skill of uh, asbestos removal and the machinery they use up there and uh, it blew my fuses. And then uh, there's also the heritage of uh, lawn mowing in New England that has already begun and is making it very noisy here. But still, I'm sorry for that uh, interruption. Um, so uh, let me just say that I'm very happy we have John Horn today with us. Um, he is professor in the Graduate School of Faculty and Sports Sciences at Vaseda University in Tokyo. Prior to joining Vaseda, he was um, the Chair of Sport and Sociology at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston and has been reader and senior lecturer in sociology in the School of Education at the University of Edinburgh. Um, he is one of the most uh, famous scholars of sports, culture and sociology. So we're um, doubly happy to have him here today. Just to mention uh, five of his over 150 publications on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> I will mention uh, Understanding the Olympics, um, uh, which he edited, uh, Mega Events and Globalization, Sports and Social Movements, Understanding Sport, Sport and Consumer Culture, Football Goes East, and Japan, Korea, and the 2002 World Cup. Um, so an, an amazing uh, range of uh, interests and uh, coverage of the topic. He was also appointed as a subject expert in the social sciences of sport to the sub-panel of sports and exercise, leisure and tourism in the 2014 research excellence framework in the UK, and was elected as a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in 2012. In 2017, he was elected as one of the inaugural research fellows at the North American Society for the Sociology of Sports. He is currently vice president and treasurer of the International Sociology of Sport Association and research committee 27 of the International Sociological Association. And he has been in the past, the chair of the British Sociological Association and has recently had the pleasure of repatriating back to the UK uh, just last week. So welcome back home and welcome to our uh, panel. I um, thank you. And over the the floor, the screen to you, John. Thank you, thank you, George. Okay. Uh, 
hopefully uh, you can see and, and hear this. Um, well, thank you very much, George. Uh, yes, I should just say I, I, I've decided to take a rest after all those things that you just mentioned. It sounded like I had a very busy year, but it did take a few years to get to this point. And yes, I have. Uh, I am speaking to you from Edinburgh rather than than Tokyo, where I've been for the last two and a half years. Um, but I remain uh, a professor, a visiting professor at uh, in the school that you mentioned. Um, the other thing to say, of course, is that I'm sandwiched between two anthropologists, which may mean that what I have to say is slightly differently nuanced uh, than, than what Bill said and what Susan says after me. Um, and I guess I'd wanted to just, in a way, cut to the chase and say something about uh, Tokyo 2020. And uh, as you can see from the slide, um, essentially, there could be more than four reasons, there may be less, but I just wanted to sp spend some time talking about some of the reasons why Tokyo uh, should be cancelled and also why it probably won't be. And to do this, I think we have to look at um, the uh, a, a broader context in which uh, what I generally describe as sports mega events have developed in the last 60 years, in the last uh, time span that that, um, that Bill was talking about. Um, and I think there are four um, sections to this talk. And really the first uh, slide here tells you everything I want to say. So if, if I got cut off, this would be what I'd want you to take home. Um, I think we need to think about sports mega events as, as growing. So historically growing in quite considerable um, scope and the main um, reason for that has to be uh, mediation. Additionally, with mediation came the possibility for um, business, uh, that is uh, marketing, uh, companies wanting to associate themselves with uh, the Olympics and the Olympic rings in particular to um, form alliances. And as, as Bill has pointed out very clearly, um, hosting an event has been about promoting um, the city, uh, the nation, and the region, um, certainly in the last 60 years. And, and we can go back into history and talk about other, other times when this, um, this was uh, a major vehicle for promoting um, a, a nation and a particular political ideology, for example. But secondly, in recent years, especially I'd say in the last 20, 25 years, we have to talk about the contemporary mega event paradox, which is that whilst more cities um, have been shown, particularly perhaps in East, East Asia and particularly China, um, but as we've heard, South Korea uh, was very keen on, on hosting the Winter Olympic Games so much that Pyeongchang um, put itself forward three times before it was eventually successful to host the 2018 Olympics, Winter Olympics. Um, at the same time as we've seen a growth of interest in hosting, there's also grown up um, an enormous amount of critique. And we'll look at some of the reasons for that in a moment. Specifically on Tokyo 2020, Bill's already touched upon some of this. Uh, he's obviously picked on the major uh, feature um, and using the phrase that I think the medical authorities use, um, there is a major concern about mass gatherings and health. There has been in the past a concern about this, but with a pandemic um, and uh, an event like uh, an Olympic Games, uh, that's obviously one of the major factors that has led uh, many medical doctors to suggest that uh, the event should not take place. We've also got issues around public opinion. Uh, at the beginning of the year, NHK, um, the, um, the public broadcaster in Japan, found that 80% of the respondents in an opinion poll thought that uh, the game should either be cancelled or postponed for a year. Um, that's slightly gone down recently. The last week, I think it was, it's gone to 72%. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, environment. 
yes, we've seen um, Bill talking about the uh, 311, the 2011 um, disaster uh, in Fukushima. And uh, people have been concerned about the way in which this has not uh, exactly been um, uh, properly dealt with, um, or critics have, have concerned that the government, the national government, hasn't dealt with that and instead has prioritized hosting a sports uh, festival. And connected to that, I think, has been the criticism that a lot of the uh, spending on the um, the event itself uh, is actually considered to be uh, wasteful in the sense of um, being uh, produced for relatively short life uh, gain uh, and um, not something that will have long standing sustainability. The factors militating against cancellation are again perhaps uh, familiar ones but need to be spelled out. The geopolitics of, uh, well, the politics of Japan, uh, Bill mentioned the, uh, the, the nostalgic yearnings of a certain generation of politicians. And I would say in the LDP, the, uh, the, 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 the party of government in Japan, which has carried on for uh, many years. Uh, the, the geopolitics of East Asia, where there is a vying for ascendancy, Japan is no longer the second largest economy in the world. China is the brother. Um, economics, well, again, uh, the Olympics has become big business. There is a major amount of money, uh, enormous amount of money spent on, on hosting the games, building up the infrastructure. Bill's mentioned how much of it will actually be apportioned towards uh, Tokyo. Um, but also there's the issue of the sponsors and the broadcasters who've put up money to either present the games or to be associated with it. And then we can't forget, of course, um, the Olympic industry, as some people call it. Um, that is the IOC, the National Olympic Committees, the organizers of the games, the Japan Olympic Committee, and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, which is a major player in hosting the event. Finally, Let's not forget, of course, that this is a, um, a, 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 a Summer Olympics is 28 or however many sports are taking place, world championships, all taking place within a very narrow uh, window, a very sh small space of time. And so athletes and sports federations are very keen that uh, something takes place for them this year. Well, Four things. Um, mega events have grown since the 1960s in, in, uh, in, in respect of three things. The new technologies of mass communication, um, the growth of the Sport Media Business Alliance that I've mentioned, and the promotional value of hosting sports mega events. Um, really, these are perhaps background information, but it's, it's worth pointing out how we didn't used to uh, be able to just watch a live sport uh, wherever we were in the world, which of course we do now and we take it for granted. Development in the technologies of mass communication and the involvement of mass communications has been a major um, influence on the growth of sports mega events and their appeal. Um, linked to that, of course, has been um, who has actually paid to broadcast the event and the, the even still today North American and in particular NBC in this case have a massive uh, interest in making sure uh, a games takes place. Uh, of course in the last uh, 15 to 20 years new media social media streaming have come along which has meant there have been as Maurice Roach has said recently um, there have been qualitative changes in event mediation, which have meant that the mega event, uh, sports mega events have grown. The business model of sports mega events since the 1980s, um, it developed initially where you could both talk about the Olympics, especially the Summer Olympics, um, but not only the Summer Olympics and the FIFA World Cup, the soccer, men's soccer World Cup, where 
um, there was a system developed uh, of, of packaging whereby specific companies could uh, gain exclusive sponsorship rights, uh, there could be exclusive broadcasting rights and link to the, this merchandising. And all these, these factors, all these influences enabled the sports mega event to become a major um, earner of money for uh, organizations such as FIFA and the International Olympic Committee. And then uh, since uh, the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, there's been uh, the specific Olympic program or the top, as it's sometimes called, where you have very uh, uh, small number of dedicated uh, uh, products associated with the games, plus all the national sponsors. And one of the features of Tokyo 2020 is that they have secured an enormous amount of money from national sponsors, as well as uh, the IOC uh, producing a lot of um, money from the, uh, the top program. The promotional value of sports mega events has been mentioned by Bill and the soft power potential of sports mega events has grown. This has led some people to suggest that sports mega events allow countries to sports wash, which is a play on that phrase greenwashing, whereby you actually are doing something or using something, in this case, a sports event or sports or uh, appearing to develop uh, green or environmentally friendly or sustainable practices as a way of obscuring perhaps rather more um, 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 uh, less uh, positive uh, policies. Roche himself says there's been a greening of mega event messaging and there has. Certainly the International Olympic Committee and most uh, hosts these days have to uh, very much describe how they are going to be uh, sustainable, uh, environmentally friendly and so on. The promotional value of sports mega events, of course, can't be lost on cities, regions, nations, and the way in which, as, as I think Bill was indicating with his slide about the um, the status or the position of Tokyo in that uh, ranking of cities um, has played on the minds of city, city uh, boosters and promoters uh, for many, many years. And a, a, a sports mega event potentially gives you uh, the opportunity to, as Tokyo did in 1964, to change the world's ideas about a particular place. And we saw in the period 2008 to 2018, uh, where um, uh, other countries who've been searching world-class ranking, the so-called BRICS nations of Brazil, Russia, India, uh, uh, People's Republic of China and South Africa, each in various ways hosted uh, a sports mega event uh, between 2008 and 2018, and did so partly in the belief that it would give them a greater positioning in the world. And again, whether this is the case or not, I think we leave for discussion later perhaps. And so Roche can quite rightly say that one of the other big things that's happened in events is that changes in event location have taken place. So this is why when we have a seminar like this, a webinar like this, we're talking about um, the Olympics in Asia and we're in the middle, sort of in the middle of, or nearing the end actually, of a uh, what you might call an East Asian era with Pyeongchang in 2018, Tokyo if it takes place this year in 21, and the Beijing Winter Olympics next year. Now, a lot of the promotional effort that's gone into sports mega events really um, has um, uh, was took off after the 1992 um, uh, Olympic Games which was held in Barcelona, when it was um, clear that most of the world was going to take part. The, the days of boycotts, such as took place in Los Angeles in 1984, and then slightly, there was still a small boycott in 1988, the Seoul Olympics, but 1992 actually saw countries such as, for example, South Africa, which had previously been banned, because of the policy of apartheid, re returning to the Olympics. And so uh, 
Barcelona, um, as so many other hosts did, uh, produced a, a mascot. Uh, this is Kobe on the left with his uh, very formal jacket and for some reason on the right, uh, completely naked. And this raised in my mind when I saw the postcard, the question, to what extent is the Olympics emperor clothed or naked? And, and in a way, it depends on who you uh, are reading, who you're listening to, and um, where, you're, uh, where you're looking. And I think in a way, uh, this explains the second of the items I wanted to mention, which is this idea of the paradox, which is that there's been a continuing growth of interest in hosting mega events, including the Olympic Paralympic Games, of course. And this has been something that we can see from um, you know, the 1960s onwards, although there was a slight dip in 1984 when only Los Angeles were really the, the only credible host. But there's been certainly a growth since, uh, since the 1980s in interest in hosting. But at the same time, we're starting to see um, in, in countries where it's possible to do so, resistances, uh, critics, um, protests about the hosting of mega events becoming what uh, some authors have described as the new normal. So somewhere in the region of 13 potential host cities have had referenda or, or, or had um, 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 votes uh, that have enabled members of the public to, to say, no, we don't want to host that event in our city. So here's downtown Tokyo. This is uh, the, the lovely tranquil picture of the, the brand new stadium that was built at a considerable expense. The rings uh, outside of the uh, new, newly built um, to, uh, Olympic Museum uh, that's, that's just behind the photographer here. And well, what can we say about uh, Tokyo? Um, First, why should it not take place? These are the, if you like, the questions about um, why, the reasons why the games should be canceled. COVID-19 pandemic, it's still raging. Mass gatherings um, are super spreader events. So many athletes, so many athletes will come, even if they are uh, uh, treated very specially and treated in a particular sort of way that prevents them from mixing with others, then uh, it, it still creates the potential for a super spreader if and when these people go back to their, their countries or if people who come with the athletes, uh, attendance, you know, there isn't, there isn't just the 11,000 athletes to worry about, it's all the other uh, people who will come. Public opinion in Japan, as I said, 72%, I think was the latest figure, are still saying the game should be canceled, um, despite the fact that the IOC and TOKO, the Tokyo Olympic uh, Organizing Committee, have been spending a lot of time recently, especially as we've just passed the 100 days to go point of view point, um, they've been spending a lot of time reassuring us that things are going to be okay. The environment, well, we've heard this. Um, it was thought that um, uh, in some ways this was going to be the recovery games. Some people have talked about the reconstruction games. And I think the critics of uh, Tokyo 2020 have been astounded that rather than reconstruction of uh, the, the, the devastated area in the Tohoku region, the northeast of Japan, um, the reconstruction primarily is focusing on um, uh, uh, creating um, a different part of, of the city, Tokyo. And environment two, second point about the environment here, is the way in which, um, as Bill pointed out, the 1964 Tokyo Summer Olympics took place in October, um, between the uh, 10th and the 24th of October. The planned games for uh, this year, last year and this year, are taking place in um, July and August, when the temperature now uh, can reach certainly in excess of 40 degrees and 40 degrees centigrade. 
and it, it, it's um, uh, no wonder that the IOC took it into their own hands in 2019 to order the uh, marathon and other road races to take place about 800 kilometers north in uh, the rather cooler but still quite warm city of Sapporo in Hokkaido. So there are issues about the, uh, the staging of this Olympics that don't really bear comparison with the 64 one. So no wonder that a, a, a few people started to arrive a few um, months ago, this was uh, February, um, starting to assemble. And this is outside the museum. Um, there is a, a few, in a way, probably the same generation that remembered 1964 and wanted to re reproduce it. For some, there was a generation who was saying, and that the um, the policies of the particular uh, the government uh, the LDP um, are, are are missing um, um, misleading and not fully understanding the real concerns of the people. So they will attend events like that. Sorry, it just slipped. Why will it take place? I think Bill's already said why in a way. Um, the national politics, the LDP, the government uh, party, uh, party in government, um, have uh, invested an awful lot in this. The previous prime minister, Abe, um, was very uh, concerned to that the games would go on. His replacement, Suga San, is equally following uh, his lead. That it would be probably bad for the their politic political futures if Tokyo did not carry on, if it, uh, Tokyo 2020 did not uh, take place. You've also got the issue of Big Brother China, who will host uh, Beijing 2022, despite the fact there are calls for boycott. China 2022, all the signals are that it's ready, willing and able to do so. And you've still got these other issues about uh, not just the North, but South Korea, um, um, having already successfully hosted uh, a games, the South, South Koreans, uh, uh, some stages have been critical of uh, Japan pushing ahead with um, the, the event. But generally speaking, what, what, what is crucial here is the general East Asian uh, geopolitical situation. Economics, the sponsors, broadcasters, Sponsors have been somewhat lukewarm when I've seen, uh, when I was in Japan and saw reports on what sponsors felt about Tokyo 2020. Some national sponsors were somewhat lukewarm about it going forward and rather reticent to actually say one way or another whether it should go ahead. Certainly the broadcasters, um, uh, and I would imagine um, um, you know, NBC would be up there, given it's it's put so much money into a very long term contract with the Olympics, uh, are expecting uh, a TV spectacle in July and August. The International Olympic Committee, the Japanese Olympic Committee, the Tokyo and the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, of course, all want the Games to take place and are doing their level best to um, uh, uh, make sure that people feel uh, it is the right thing to do. And as I've mentioned already, sport, the international associations and federations are gearing up. So in recent uh, days, around about five days ago, I found these stories on the internet. Um, as you can see, um, maybe it's because very few people are going to go to the Olympics, but Japan on course for strongest medal showing at the Summer Olympics. Um, the medical group, on the other hand, medic medics have been saying Tokyo 2020 will be difficult to stage. Uh, the IOC, on the other hand, are very confident the Japanese public will get behind Tokyo 20. Uh, there was a sort of humorous item about Team GB, that's the, the British Olympic team, um, have shipped, it took 55 days apparently, have shipped containers containing porridge, uh, 
games of Jenga and 45,000 tea bags uh, amongst their luggage to make the Team GB feel at home. So they believe the games are taking place. But as Bill said, there's been a very slow response to the vaccination possibilities. 100 days until Tokyo Games, but Japan has vaccinated less than 1% its population. And my understanding of talking to volunteers, the people who volunteered to work uh, at Tokyo 2020, is that they are not being considered for vaccination uh, and being given some very, uh, you know, two face masks and some hand sanitizer to keep them safe. 72% of the Japanese public want the games canceled or postponed. That was uh, a few days ago. And we heard as well last week how the Olympic torch relay had to take a detour through um, the, um, uh, the Olympic, uh, the, through the park in, in Osaka because Osaka's COVID cases have been rising uh, rapidly and worse than most other places. So as one of the demonstrators I, I photographed uh, a few months ago uh, had around their neck, uh, in, in, a, in a balanced uh, scientific, medically scientific way, it was seen that cancellation of the Olympics is maybe the best and only choice, but whether that will be the choice that's made, uh, uh, we will have to wait and see. Thank you, John. Um, I'm happy to say I'm still here and uh, following everything. So um, I will uh, continue. We will continue with uh, Susan Brownell's presentation. I had two running metaphors for this uh, panel today. One was that I feel I'm uh, on the shoulders of giants with the three speakers. And the other one is that in my attempt to present them, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to cover the distance of uh, a marathon, but uh, with a small fraction of the time. And I will do the same thing with uh, Susan's uh, introduction here, uh, because there's so much to say. Uh, first of all, um, uh, Dr. Brownell is, 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 has some connection with, a personal connection with China through her uh, family history as well. And I'm starting in reverse, uh, a sequence of importance here, perhaps, to uh, the topic. But she has also been, uh, she's also a nationally ranked track field uh, athlete in the US before she joined the track team in Beijing University in 1985 to 86, uh, while she was there taking Chinese lessons. And she also represented Beijing in the 1986 Chinese National College Games and set the national record for the heptathlon. Now, uh, academically, she is an internationally recognized expert in Chinese sports, Olympic Games, and World Fairs. Um, in fact, one of the most interesting books for us uh, that teach on the Olympics is the edition on the 1904 uh, St. Louis Olympics and the so-called anthropology days. Um, she has also done work, field work in China, primarily in Beijing and Shanghai. She did research at the Olympic Games in Athens Rio, uh, Pyongyang, and um, at the university, she teaches courses on the body and culture, medicine and culture and history, and the senior seminar and course on China, East Asia, and health and medicine. Very, very pertinent to today's uh, situation with uh, Tokyo. Um, I will mention a few of her publications, again, only a fraction of them. Um, her first book was, in fact, the first fieldwork um, conducted in China by a Westerner. This came out in 1995, and the title was Training the Body for China, Sports in, in, in the Moral Order of the People's Republic. Other books include Beijing Games, What the Olympics Mean to China. And she co-authored and edited a number of really, really important uh, uh, books for the study of the Olympics and sports. Uh, I'll mention three here, The Anthropology of Sports, Bodies, Borders, and Biopolitics, uh, as I mentioned, the 1904 Anthropology Days and Olympic Games. I think this book is imperative in understanding the role of Western countries and their position um, with respect to the 1936 Olympics uh, in Berlin. I think uh, it's impossible to understand the history of those particular games without looking at the prehistory of 1904. And uh, last one, last two actually, 
uh, one credited here with uh, William Kelly, whom we have on the panel. Uh, the Olympics in East Asia, nationalism, regionalism, and globalism on the center stage of world sports. And last, um, from Athens to Beijing, West meets East in the Olympic Games, um, which is an addition in Greek words. Um, and I will stop there, Susan. Um, I apologize for not going through all of them. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's an impressive record. And I will uh, pass on the screen to you at this point. And um, we look forward to the end and we'll discuss everything uh, that we have uh, been talking about. So welcome. Great, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And I just wish I could actually be on the Yale campus and see everybody in person, but this is a, in a way an interesting substitute. I do find myself a little bit nervous. This is only the second webinar presentation I've given and it's such a strange medium, but welcome to everybody who's attending and let me proceed to share my screen. Okay, I think I have everything set, although here I am at the end, not the beginning. Hmm. Is this working okay? The uh, proportions seem a little bit off. Is this fine? Can you hear me? Looks great. Looks yep. great, Susan. Go ahead. Okay. So, my talk today is about Olympic Games, human rights, and China. And as a China scholar, my attention was drawn to the issue of human rights in sport during the 2008 Beijing Olympics. At the time, I thought that the heated public criticism of those Olympic Games was because they were taking place, of course, in the People's Republic of China, a country who, whose human rights record has been criticized in the developed West ever since its founding in 1949. However, further research revealed that there was a broader context, and that was the timely convergence of an Olympic Games in China with a global trend. The global trend was what I am calling the NGOization of global society. So scholars have shown that there's been a rapid rise of non-governmental organizations or NGOs since the end of the Cold War. Before 1992, boycotts um, had been led by national governments protesting against other nations, most notably, of course, the Soviet and US-led boycotts in 1980 and 1984. So in 2008, although the word boycott was used to describe the political furor, uh, the situation, in fact, was very different from the Cold War boycotts. After the end of the Cold War, the number of registered NGOs worldwide had increased in exponentially. Uh, there were about 6,000 international NGOs in 1990 and more than 26,000 in 1999. By 2008, the number had reached some 40,000. The membership and budgets of the largest ones exceeded that of many nations. One of the biggest is the environmental NGO Greenpeace. In 2008, it had offices in 40 countries and claimed nearly 3 million donors worldwide with global fundraising income of 310 million US dollars. Amnesty International or AI had sections in 52 countries and its international secretariat in London had membership revenues of 68 million US dollars. In 1995, the IOC had added environment as the third pillar of the Olympic movement, the so-called third pillar after sport and culture and education. The IOC began to collaborate with the United Nations on Agenda 21 on the environment. Although the IOC leadership did keep its distance from the UN out of a concern that the IOC would be co-opted into serving the UN's agenda, this is something that I was told by insiders that isn't, is, isn't something you'll find in the public pronouncements about how well they get along. 
At the Sydney 2000 Olympics, Greenpeace became the first major NGO to successfully utilize the media platform provided by the Olympic Games. And it um, has run campaigns in association with each summer games since that time. After each games, it issues a report on environmental protection um, during the games. And its success in gaining public attention became a model for other NGOs. The internet revolutionized the ability of NGOs to mobilize public opinion and link up across national boundaries, enabling large numbers of NGOs to unify and descend on a target. This was called an NGO swarm in a 2002 report by the Rand Corporation, which argued that NGOs have been gaining strength at the cost of governments. And the world of Olympic games and international sports is an, actually a very interesting venue to look at whether this is in fact happening. The Beijing Olympic games became the first Olympic games to be targeted by an NGO swarm. And human rights became the second big wave after the environment to gain global attention um, during the uh, lead up to the Olympic games owing to this swarm. At least 50, by my count, uh, intergovernmental or non-governmental organizations claimed attention for various facets of human rights in the context of the Beijing Olympic Games. Um, they brought attention to a huge range of issues. For example, oppression of ethnic minorities and dissidents, mass evictions, abolition of the death penalty, prison labor, the list really goes on and on. Uh, so the number of issues included under the label of human rights was a new phenomenon. The previous government-led boycotts had typically focused on one political issue, such as in 1980, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, or in 1984, security concerns uh, and anti-Soviet hysteria on the part of the Soviets. Tibet had been a major political focus in, 19, in um, 2008, and pro-Tibet groups played a major role in disrupting the international torch relay, and that got a lot of attention. Xinjiang received less attention, but the effectiveness of the Tibet activism did lay a path for today's Xinjiang activists. In 2008, in addition to the pro-Tibet groups, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch were the most vocal of the international organizations. Um, just uh, to give you a sense of the amount of work they did, in the year before the games, Human Rights Watch put out nearly 90 news releases, op-eds, and letters to world leaders. And these campaigns were successful in attracting donors. I, I think uh, one thing I realized in interviewing representatives of these NGOs is that they do, you know, rely on donor money and Olympic Games are um, attractive to donors. So the annual revenues of AI's International Secretariat jumped by 30% to US $88 million. Human Rights Watch um, called upon the IOC to list human rights as the fourth pillar of Olympism and to include human rights in the host city contract. Um, at the time, I thought this would never happen. So it's very interesting that um, Human Rights Watch maintained this pressure right up until the IOC finally did amend the contract um, nine years later. And I'll say something about this shortly. So here it's important to point out that the IOC itself is an NGO, as is FIFA and all of the international sport federations. So they were really part of the NGOization of global society, and they benefited from it with their growth um, in both revenues and political influence. The relationship of the sport NGOs to the social issue NGOs and to the United Nations is a complicated one, and it does vacillate between collaboration and antagonism. In claiming that the IOC has enough influence over governments to effect changes in human rights, AI and Human Rights Watch um, in, at a, on another level were attributing a new level of power to NGOs that was not previously attributed to them. So did that actually help to make them more powerful? Are they that powerful? 
Um, I'm not totally sure about that. I think it's an open question. So as the Beijing Olympics approached, the IOC endured aggressive questioning about how they could justify giving the games to an authoritarian government with questionable human rights um, record and how the games were, as they claimed, supposed to change China for the better. The IOC relied on a rhetorical strategy that dated to the Cold War era of boycotts led by national governments. And it was guided by one mantra, politics should not be mixed with sports. The IOC is not a political organization. Uh, in addition, they drew on the 19th century neoclassical tradition that had led to the so-called revival of the ancient Olympics in their modern form. Um, those of you who are fam familiar with uh, you know, Greek humanism will perhaps recognize uh, the, Greek, the ancient Greek humanistic uh, sort of tradition that's expressed here. The ancient Greeks, like today's international sports world, recognize that peoples from diverse backgrounds can be mobilized behind vague, abstract, and inspirational ideals, whereas rules and laws tend to divide people. So the IOC then, and really still now, has a tendency to cite the fundamental principles in its constitution. The constitution is known as the Olympic Charter. Um, and and the, there is a fundamental principle that asserts that um, the IOC's goal is to place sport in the service of promoting a peaceful society concerned with the preservation of human dignity. But the problem with this philosophy as a communication strategy in 2008 was that as long as the IOC held to these grand principles such as dignity and harmonious development, it could be dragged into almost any ethical argument and made responsible for almost any social ill because human dignity and harmonious development connect with all aspects of human life. For example, Amnesty International could argue that the death penalty is a violation of human dignity and therefore the IOC should oppose it. The IOC was dragged into discussions of political issues and at that time its only real defense was to say we are not a political organization, which seemed absurd under the circumstances. Meanwhile, uh, for a decade, there had been developed developments in the corporate world that some major sport organizations had started to adopt, but the IOC had largely ignored them. The concept of social responsibility had evolved along with this NGOization of global society. Probably it was a response to the, if you want to be cynical, a response of the corporate world to the ever louder criticism from NGOs. The sports world followed the corporate world and throughout the 2000s, the focus in international sports shifted from environmental sustainability, which as you might recall, you know, going back to that Greenpeace protest had been the, the first of these um, sort of, uh, NGO swarm issues that the international sports world had responded to. And then it began to shift from that to social responsibility. In 1999, the European Football, the Union of European Football Associations, or UEFA, might have been one of the first major sport organizations to hire a specialist in sustainability, social responsibility. Um, although that label had not yet appeared, they hired an expert to direct the response to the Balkan crisis. And then in 2004, the IOC hired a person whose job title was sustainability officer. Sport Accord is the um, sort of rebranded name of the General Association of International Sport Federations. It established a social responsibility and integrity unit in 2009 and this was directly an experience. Uh, it, it was a response to the experience of the Beijing Olympic Games. In 2014, the IOC hired away the Sport Accord director of that office into a renamed ethics and compliance office. So in short, international sports organizations began to adopt a corporate style approach to human rights by narrowly defining them as a management problem 
this distinction is important for the IOC because the main thing that it does, the main thing that the IOC does is to oversee the organization of a sports event. So by incorporating social responsibility into event organization, it allowed it to focus precisely on the work that it actually does. And this did allow it to justify a retreat from the broad claims that sport betters all of society, a claim that of course it couldn't prove. Um, these actions also followed a long list of newly established international organizations and guiding principles dedicated to human rights in business, which then began to extend into the world of sports. Uh, one of the really big developments, probably sort of the, the foundational development, was that in 2011, the United Nations created its guiding principles on business and human rights, the UNGP. In 2012, the International Standards Organization, or the ISO, confirmed a new standard. I don't know if many of you are aware of the ISO. It's the sort of most influential global organization you never heard of um, because it does, it makes global society possible by developing standards for things like how many threads should be on a screw. But in recent years, it's been moving into environment and social responsibility. And this is what happened with the, this new standard ISO 20121. And this is a standard, this is how it's described for event sustainability management systems. And these are guidelines for managing high profile transient events that aim to ensure that the event contributes to sustainable development. And that is defined as a balanced approach to economic activity, environmental responsibility and social progress that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And the standard does explicitly mention social justice. So the Olympic um, Organizing Committees for London, Rio, Pyeongchang, Tokyo, and Beijing have all achieved ISO 20121 certification. And starting with the 2018 Olympics, the host city contract actually required every Olympic organizing committee to attain, um, obtain certification. And then in January of 2017, as I mentioned, the IOC actually added provisions about human rights to the Olympic host city contract, um, but this will not be effective until the contract that governs Paris in 2024. It stated that games related activities should be conducted in alignment with the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights. So that's why I mentioned that the 2011 creation of that document was sort of foundational for what is happening now. And this is an example of the fact that since 2008, the IOC has aligned many operations more closely with the UN. Uh, one, one big change that made this happen was that Jacques Raga stepped down at the end of his uh, second term as required as IOC president and was replaced by a lawyer, a German, Th Thomas Bach. And this marked an important generational change between the old generation sort of formed in the Cold War context and a new corporate legalistic model. Um, so just to give you a little bit more detail about this new um, clause in the host city contract, the name of the clause is protection and respect of human rights. And it explains that, that ensuring that games related activities do not harm people is an essential dimension of the success of the Olympic and Paralympic games and the lasting benefits they can lead to the host city, the host region and the host country. Now here's what's interesting is that despite this corporate legalistic approach, they don't completely abandon the reference to the fundamental principles. So it goes on to say, this is directly related to the fundamental principles of Olympism and the positive values that the Olympic and Paralympic games represent and promote. The games offer an opportunity to further strengthen these principles and values in very tangible and effective ways. So you can see they're, they're waffling a little. They're trying to have the best of both worlds with both this more limited corporate model, but still uh, claiming um, that they are backed by universal human values. The emphasis on quote unquote, very tangible and effective ways um, kind of demonstrates though, 
this turn from broad philosophical principles toward concrete actions. And the clause does specifically list the most controversial issues that the IOC has faced over the previous decade. So migrant workers, labor conditions, displacement of the local population, discrimination, child safeguarding, peaceful assembly, and media freedom. So there have really been big changes in the policies surrounding human rights in Olympic games and also um, in the FIFA World Cup and in other major sporting events. But what about reality? So um, the shift I think is part of a bigger picture in which corporations and international non-governmental organizations, including the IOC of course, are being held more accountable for violations of human rights, um, which was a realm originally conceived of as controlled by national governments. And corporations and sport organizations have started to sort of negotiate with NGOs, whereas previously they were much more antagonistic, hoping, I think, that the NGOs will reduce their attacks and along with it, the negative media coverage and the harm to the reputations um, of these sport organizations. The collaboration between the UN, the NGOs and sport organizations or corporations has really redefined specific human rights issues as technical or managerial problems under this category of social responsibility. And the result is that sport organizations and corporations um, in some ways have now been signed publicly assigned a, an authority over human rights that they didn't previously possess because it was assigned to national governments. But these policies only have a weak legal force. They do borrow some strength from the way in which they are linked with an entire web of policies put forth by very different international actors such as the IOC, the UN, the ISO, and also public-private collect collaboratives. I mean, I haven't said anything about the mega sporting events platform, but that is an interesting collaborative involving the governments of the US and Switzerland, as well as um, corporations and sport organizations. And then finally, as I pointed out, they have written into the Olympic host city contract, uh, human rights, which does make it seem like they have a legal force because after all, it's a contract. But in fact, the host city contract is a very weak legal document and it almost never results in lawsuits. Um, so let me just talk then about boycotts and whether a boycott of Beijing might actually happen. In 2008, actually no national Olympic committee, no head of state, no famous athlete, no famous active athlete actually called for nations to boycott the games altogether. There were heads of state who announced they would not attend the opening ceremonies. That's being called uh, now a diplomatic boycott. Since the Cold War, really a consensus against boycotts had, um, has emerged, at least among those people who actually make the decisions about whether countries will go to the Olympic Games. I think the consensus is that boycotts don't accomplish political goals and they harm the athletes. The US boycott of the, 80, uh, the 1980 Games on the basis that the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan was really um, something that was discredited when the US itself invaded Afghanistan uh, decades later. And I think that situation did serve to discredit the effectiveness of boycotts. And I think at the moment that situation seems to be the same in 2021 and the consensus seems to be holding, but something is different. And that is the number of human rights organizations involved in these Olympic protests, which has really increased exponentially. In February, for example, over 180 organizations announced an alliance and wrote and, and sort of issued a public letter uh, against the, and they, did, they were arguing for a boycott of the Beijing games. Um, they were mostly regional associations in support of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang uh, in, uh, the, and minorities in Tibet also Taiwan and Hong Kong. And so that's 180 organizations compared to my count of 50 in 2008. 
for the future, do these new arrangements between international organizations and organizing committees reflect any real changes in the amount of power that the IOC exerts over the human rights abuses in any given country? Are NGOs and the UN gaining new leverage over governments as claimed in that 2002 RAND report? I, I do think it's possible that the UN might have been strengthened by the new collaborations with NGOs, including the IOC. This alliance might have been good for each of them, even though sport NGOs still tend to dislike dealing with the UN, which they perceive as arrogant. Um, but I think in the case of China, I really doubt that the government will give up much power over human rights to NGOs, to the UN or the IOC. If human rights improve heading into the 2022 Winter Games, I think it will be because the Chinese government wants to improve them for its own political purposes, not because it feels that it has been forced to improve them. And it may be really that the more important change is actually the increased public awareness of human rights issues involved in Olympic Games because that increased public pressure and media scrutiny may have more impact on the new policies um, if indeed there is any impact. But I think the area in which we might really see some change may be a more limited area, but let's not completely dismiss it. And I'm talking about the pressure on corporations, so Olympic sponsors and suppliers. And this could at least produce significant results in the area of fair labor. This is being taken very seriously in Tokyo, even though the um, requirements for that are written much more strongly into the, uh, the host city contract for the next Olympic Games, not this one. Tokyo is being sort of proactive in that respect. As John pointed out, the Sport Business Alliance is becoming, it's a tighter alliance, they're more tightly intertwined, they're becoming more wealthy and probably more powerful and influential globally. So maybe the dynamic we should really be considering is whether the new model for event management will produce new business practices among corporations. Maybe that might influence governments indirectly rather than directly. And thank you, that's the end of my talk. Great. Thank you, uh, Susan. Uh, we can all return to the screen and uh, open um, for questions. Um, we have two for John, and um, I have um, a couple myself, but maybe we can start with the ones from the audience. There was one that was retracted on uh, why we're not discussing the 210 uh, youth games in Singapore. And um, the simple reason for that was uh, economy of uh, the topic and time. Uh, we're not discussing Paralympics either, and there have been uh, so many um, new uh, uh, directions that the Olympic Committee has, uh, has taken its activities that uh, we just wanted to concentrate on these particular ones. Uh, uh, and actually the Winter Olympics almost never get as much attention as the ones that are gonna happen in uh, China. So that is a little bit of a, a digression as well, but um, that's, that was the reason for us not discussing uh, the youth games. But um, maybe, um, we can start with the two questions that we have for uh, John. Um, one, John, can you read the questions or shall I read them to the public? Yeah, I've read, I've read them actually. Um, and, um, I, you know, the first one, if you want to read them out, I don't mind. Uh, um, but um, I think our audience can see them, so it's, it's okay. So go ahead, respond. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the first one is about. Um, uh, what happens when places have a uh, referenda and uh, the public says no? Um, are the IOC responding is my summary of that question. And um, I believe they are. I think uh, Susan has also shown how the IOC has been responding to various challenges um, by uh, well, it depends how you see it. As you say, it could be cynical, but you focus down on the management uh, issue. You transform a general issue into one of, you know, controlling a particular uh, issue in a particular way. And, and as Susan pointed out, that, that, that transforming the human rights issue into a, a 
and management of the events issue is is one way of doing that. Um, I think um, I've I've listened to quite a few international Olympic Committee um, sponsored seminars, and I've been very interested to hear some of the insiders, some of the people who work in Lausanne who talk very much about controlling the narrative. They are uh, learning or they've learned that they must get their um, way of understanding the world across better. And um, I think that's another of the ways in which they have been responding. They, they, are, they are aware of a problem. You know, you can't miss, you know, 12, 13 referenda saying we don't want the Olympics near us. You can't avoid that. And so actually related to the Singapore and the Youth Olympic Games issue, the Youth Olympic Games, which is an initiative, I believe, um, that was something that Jacques Roger, the previous president of the IOC, was most concerned to, to introduce. is also a kind of future proofing. And future proofing is a phrase that, that I've used before. And I think this is what the IOC have been trying to do. They've been trying to think about how they can deal with, for example, the international, the Summer Olympics becoming not terribly interesting to the a younger age group. They look at they look at the demography of the viewing uh, of the viewers, and they see that the games were not terribly attractive. So, what do you know? Tokyo's got skateboarding and surfing and climbing. You know, th th this is one way in which the IOC does does adapt. I mean, one of the things about the IOC, you know, 125 uh, years old last year. Um, sorry, 120, 125, 125, yeah. Um, it manages the, 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 the problems in a way that all, you know, enterprises try to do they're seeking to preserve themselves. So they look for self-preservation mechanism. Now, this is not necessarily criticism. This is just a recognition of something that's lasted so long has been able to continue because it, it can change or it tries to change. Um, it's confronted with issues, but um, it, it tries to change. The other part of the question was, Will there always be places that want to host the Olympics? And the answer to that is yes, there will always be places. And in fact, one of the ways in which the, Olymp the, the IOC has changed, again, this is under Thomas Bach as much as anybody, is the introduction of the possibility for an Olympic host, not just to be a city, not just to be a region in a country, but to be more than one country. Uh, this, this was put forward in, in 2019, I think it was. The proposal is, is quite a different way of thinking about who can host an Olympics. Rather than being city specific, they've opened it up. It doesn't mean that will ever happen, but they're, 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 they're given that opportunity. And so, for example, the Gold Coast, which seems to be uh, the, the area in Australia, uh, in um, uh, Queensland, Australia, and uh, uh, a province of, of, of Australia, uh, is likely to be the host for 2032. We don't know that for sure yet, but that's one thing. But then you hear about other possibilities. I read somewhere that um, Berlin and Tel Aviv may even put in a joint bid for 2036. Uh, I, I, you know, the the the, the historical resonance of that date is just you know i just find it astounding but they might do that whether they'll succeed or not is another so yes there is there is an adaptability i think bill talked about this as well this kind of things change but things stay the same and the thing that stays the same is somehow the ioc you know it's a private club with members you can't get elected to it but you can be brought in if you know you you fit and um you know, it, it, it has an amazing capacity for self-preservation. Great, thank you. Uh, there's a question for Susan from uh, Professor Wright. Uh, Susan, can you see the question or shall I read it? Uh, 
Um, I can see it, but if you go ahead and read yeah. it. Uh, the question is, how does the NGO swarm concerning HR specifically relate to China's dovetail with the United States foreign policy towards China and the goal of confronting China's global ascendancy? Yeah, I think that's a really thought-provoking question in comparison with 2008. In 2008, Bush was president. He was rather pro-China. I mean, he was regarded as sort of friendly towards China. He really used those Olympic Games well to, I think, promote you know, a friendly perception of uh, a perception of a friendly relationship between the U.S. and China. He became the first uh, U.S. president to attend an opening ceremony outside the U.S. when he attended those opening ceremonies. And so the tenor of that games was really friendship between China and the U.S. And I was a U.S. Fulbright scholar in that year, so I did have um, interactions with the U.S. embassy. And I know that they were um, not happy with all the negative criticism of China in the media. And you know that was just not what they wanted to happen. So now fast forward, we have a very different president in office. We have um, more controversial, more contentious relationship between China and the US. I mean, the 2008 games marked China's emergence as a superpower. They were intended to. That's what the Chinese wanted them to do. That was you know, what the narrative was surrounding those games. And I personally felt that immediately after those games, the perception of China as a threat just in popular me uh, media and in the public increased. So they succeeded in marking China's emergence as a superpower. And I think greater sort of... Um, fear and also demonization went along with that. So that, that's the context we have in 2022. And I mean, I like, like you, George, I thought these are a winter Olympic games. They're a small event, who's, who's really gonna care? And I've been shocked at the level of attention to the political issues in China surrounding this, which is, it's really on the level of what was happening in Beijing, uh, surrounding Beijing 2008 by this time. I think I've already gotten more requests, for example, for interviews from journalists than I had at this time, you know, before the games in 08. So, um, so it, it's clear that, that uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of, um, on all sides from politicians in the US, probably politicians globally, NGOs. Uh, there's a lot of fear, distrust, and dislike of China that is going to come out in the course of these games. Um, I guess, um, you know, with Biden being so new in office, I think his China policy is still taking shape. So I, I can't quite um, say how the games might be used in confronting China's ascendancy. Um, I might just, I, I suspect that Biden won't be so clear about using the games themselves as a platform as Bush was. So I, it, I think the games will be just sort of part of a, a bigger thing going on with the Biden administration. Um, it's interesting you should mention the effect of the 208 uh, Chinese Olympics because before the Olympics, I was in uh, Olympia teaching at a summer school which was primarily of uh, uh, mostly American students from colleges, including two students from China. And the ones who were obsessed about talking about the Olympics were the American students. The Chinese students were fairly sort of uh, blasé and comfortable about the fact, but the American students were a little bit more, um, let's say a little bit combative about uh, why China is doing the Olympics. So already before the games took place, there was a certain defensiveness. And it also added a different, different dimension to that conversation. I want to return uh, to uh, Bill and the question of 1964, what it meant for Japan. There's an interesting uh, follow-up to this with the 1972 uh, Munich Olympics and what that meant for Germany returning back to the international community. And this uh, suggestion that we just heard from John that uh, Berlin and Tel Aviv might host, um, um, might host the future Olympics. And my question, Bill, is it looks like uh, the case of Japan is a good case for arguing that the, actually the Olympic movement is, if not the cause for development, at least the catalyst for development. And um, it's interesting that in the criteria that Susan presents about eligibility, 
this question of economic development does not seem to be very uh, prominent. So would you argue in defense of the committee that it actually stimulates economic growth or at least propels plans that um, might have taken uh, decades to complete? I'm, I'm pretty sure Greece would not have had a metro by 204 had it not have uh, the Olympics as a goal. So well, no, I, I, would, I would agree with you that um, it can be a stimulus and impetus uh, an excuse for uh, this kind of economic development, infrastructural particularly. Um, it, the evidence, though, it seems to me over the broad sweep of Olympic history, and we've had so many games in so many different locations that actually the Olympics becomes a really interesting sector of the global economy in which to look at questions of you know, what, what stimulus in the direction of growth. But the evidence is quite mixed. I mean, I think many things happened in Tokyo uh, that proved advantageous to the improvement of daily life, but uh, priorities were also deformed. For instance, the rush to get the Shinkansen, the bullet train, um, ready and up and running before the Olympics um, required such an, a budget overrun and such a, a, a distortion of, of labor that the eight highway systems that were planned for metropolitan Tokyo actually got put on hold and never got done. Um, so the Olympics are responsible for lots of, of good things that happened to, to metropolitan Tokyo, but it also um, tends to uh, uh, d deform the priorities, perhaps in ways that. I mean, if you get if you fly into Tokyo, and you now arrive in downtown Haneda Airport rather than Narita, uh, there is the famous monorail that is supposed to take you from the airport down to Central Tokyo Station. Problem was um, they got to pushing the monorail almost to Tokyo Station, and the need for more money for the bullet train caused them to stop the monorail three stops before Tokyo Station. So, I mean, it's a trivial example, but it's suggestive of ways in which the, the rush to create projects for prestige um, are not necessarily the most rational uh, urban planning or replanning. Um, and I think there are many examples in Montreal, certainly in Rio, in Athens, in, in Atlanta, um, of, that, of, of ways in which the Olympic kind of infrastructural bubble um, has some deleterious effects as well. But as I say, generally, for anyone interested in, you know, in, in those kinds of issues, look at the Olympic history, because it really pro provides a really fascinating comparative set of cases um, for these kinds of questions. I think the case of Athens might be a good, um, <laughs> a good case for irony here, in that <laughs> if you exclude the economic collapse, yeah. Actually, Athens is a transformed city since yeah. the Olympics. And the airport was necessary and it was done. Right. The highway was necessary and it was done. The metro right. was necessary and it was done. It just right. came at a very expensive price. Right. right. Um, there is another question, but I wanted to address um, uh, a question to John about um, the mega events and the coverage. Um, we all watch the Olympics if we're not there from uh, our own respective countries. And I have seen most of my Olympics when I was in Cyprus. When I first watched them in America, I thought I was watching a different games. The coverage was exclusively of American athletes. Um, major sports where Americans were not prominent were neglected and never shown, not even the award ceremony. So I'm wondering whether now we're all going to be watching the same games, uh, the American games. And I'm using this as a, uh, because, I'm getting to this because the first time we had a, a film about the Olympics in 1936, Riefenstahl had actually edited four different versions of them, depending on which country she was going to screen the film. So I'm pretty sure the Germans saw a different Olympics the French saw a different Olympics and the English and the Americans show, saw a different one. Uh, 
are we now moving to a point where uh, one TV station or channel is going to be controlling the world rights? And uh, we're all going to be watching whoever um, the most um, uh, consumerist audience is inclined to watch, which is mostly American, right? The soul games were, you know, held at, you know, in the middle of the night because the audiences here were not going to stay up at three o'clock in the morning to watch them. Is there such an event? Is there such a phenomenon becoming naturalized now that we're only going to be watching? what the TV channels determine have the highest ad value? Well, I, I think it, it can be over, overplayed, that suggestion, because one, one thing that the IOC um, do, for example, is they're concerned not just for, you know, surplus or profit, as we might call it in other worlds, um, but um, they want reach as well. They want people to see um, the Olympics. That that mm. is part of the, you know, the 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 ambition for the for the Olympics to be a global spectacle. But it, it's a spectacle where you have you know local interests. Certain sports in certain countries, you know, are much more. I mean, the IOC produces or collects data on who watches which sports in which country. So they know not just the demography, they, uh, you know, the ages of the people who are watching, but they know where certain sports are watched. And they also know that certain sports, I can't remember now, but there are certain sports that really shouldn't be in the Olympics anymore because they get very few people watching them. But they're there because of tradition. And the IOC has to sort of, it balances, you know, tradition with, with change. So um, this, in addition to the fact that, of course, the model that I outlined br very crudely and briefly um, is under threat. You mm -hmm. know, the, the economic model is under threat because of the new media, because of the streaming capacity uh, potential. So I think you, you are as more likely to get very dedicated, very specific uh, Olympics experience, a bit like you were saying about the difference between a, a US citizen and a, a Cypriot, Cypriot. Uh, or Greek citizen, you know, how, how, um, how different could it be? Um, so I think the danger of that isn't, isn't so great, but um, certainly um, the the value or the the amount of money that um, NBC, for example, have put into the Olympics shows what what it means to them in terms of their scheduling mm -hmm. and their preparation, for example, for the next season. Yeah. Um, Can I add something to that, George? Yes, please go ahead. Is, I mean, it may be that the seven point five billion dollar contract is somewhat transitional because the formation of the Olympic Broadcasting service, um, which is on the one hand trying to centralize and control uh, broadcasting on, through, on various channels, um, is going to change the nature of Olympic uh, broadcasting, it seems. If anything, I agree with John, the direction is probably more towards narrow casting, multicasting, rather than uh, a homogenous view. I mean, the irony of the Olympics, as you hinted, is that in some ways, the most provincial view of the Olympics are in the major countries like the US. The smaller countries have a much more cosmopolitan experience with the Olympics because they have so fewer participants and teams that they actually look at a wider range of sports and have access to a, a more Olympic experience than the Americans who sit there and simply watch the American flag flying in as many venues as it can. Um, so it's, there, there are many ironies to the Olympics, but that's certainly, I think, one of the most powerful and, and overlooked. But it'd be interesting to see the Olympic Broadcasting Service, the degree, I mean, it has 75 media contracts around the world. So there's 75 different you know, sort of flows now that are going out of the broadcasting center. Um, and I think that's going to, that's going to, 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 to fragment uh, the Olympic viewing experience more than uh, standardize it. I think that in this case, fragmentation is a good thing. And, and you actually yeah. hit the nail on the head when you said 
I felt that the American Olympics I was watching were it was so much more poor in terms of what I was watching in Cyprus. And uh, you know, it's what I call the, the dilemma of um, uh, the parochialism of the center. Yeah. Right? Very um, I had a different question that had to do with this uh, health issue that we're dealing with now. Um, and many of you have worked on this topic of uh, uh, training bodies, health, tradition, uh, and uh, the modernity of sports culture. In the class, we covered a, a rather polemical uh, text by Galen, where he accuses um, um, athletes, professional athletes, of being like pigs, that they don't really have any minds, that they destroy their bodies. Um, and essentially, he's, uh, he's targeting a particular professional class of athletes in late antiquity. Um, that uh, are there to make, uh, basically win the game and uh, make money. And the tension between professional doctors like him and trainers. And I find that this tension is still operating within the university as I ask my own students, whether there is a difference between the advice they get from their trainers and their doctors. And would you say that now, I think both of you, I mean, a number of you, but I think Susan Moore touched on this, this question of, um, are we having economic interest Trump um, health issues in Tokyo particularly? Um, are we still sort of in this, because you know, we need to put up the spectacle no matter what. I think one of the uh, American gymnasts was saying, you know, I am going no matter what. And that no matter what is quite a big, big no matter. I mean, that means nothing matters other than athletics. And I'm wondering if, if there is a way for us to revisit this question broadly, uh, not just for the Olympics, but also in the ways that athletics affect body perceptions, anorexia, um, all sorts of other health issues that are, um, that are the result of athletic engagement, not uh, the other way around. We tend to think of uh, uh, you know, athletic education as a health uh, enhancing activity, but it, it also carries a lot of risks. And I'm wondering if you have any kind of- I guess this one of the, <laughs> again, another of those enduring ironies of, yes. of the Olympics and Olympism. Elite sports is bad for your body. I mean, it, it, it is, it, I mean, almost all the time. And the notion that the Olympics are dressed up in these uh, rarefied sort of philosophical verities about healthy mind, healthy body um, is camouflage uh, for what is done often quite willingly. I mean, we you can blame the trainers, you can blame the doctors, but um, to a large extent, it's the athlete themselves that are willing and able to ruin their bodies uh, long-term for a potential short-term uh, recognition and, and, and profit. I'm going to ask my students to comment on this bill for next class, because we are actually looking at the uh, drug uh, enhancement, uh, you know, uh, in the games, uh, prosthetics, and this question of, uh, of uh, intersex. Uh, uh, well, I hate to say it, but that's as true for Yale sports as it is for yes. Olympic sports. You, you ask yeah. Yale athletes what they have put their bodies through since they were eight years old. Um, and it's an alarming medical report from most of the uh, recruited athletes at, at Yale. Susan, did you want to comment on this? Or, uh... Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to comment on a, a more narrow angle because I've um, been doing research on mass gatherings and, you know, pandemics. And, um, you know, actually, despite like all the panic and the perception that huge numbers of mass gatherings are acting as super spreader events, we, we have like almost no good scientific evidence that mass gatherings, like especially spectator sports, have sparked any outbreaks of COVID or any outbreaks of anything ever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, particularly yeah. sport, sport events are um, really safe, apparently, if you go back and look at the historical record and try to look for outbreaks. So, um, I'm, so I've actually got a National Science Foundation proposal um, submitted on this topic, trying to figure out what's going on. 
Um, so this is just an interesting part of what's going on with Tokyo, you know, the panic, uh, uh, the perception that an Olympic Games could act as a super spreader event. And I, I, I guess the reason you don't have more medical experts um, speaking out and trying to point out maybe there's not that big of a source of concern is probably just because the science isn't all that good. And so who's going to um, risk their reputation saying it's actually pretty safe and then have you know something happen. But um, you know, based on my research into the science of um, spectator sports in particular and mass gatherings in general, I, I actually feel pretty safe at mass gatherings as long as you're not locked up with people in small bathrooms or in bars, you know, in the context of the mass gathering, um, you know, that that is dangerous maybe, but being a spectator probably isn't all that dangerous. <laughs> yeah. um, I have one last question before we go, and this is um, from one of the students, uh, uh, Daniel Posner, and I think, uh, Susan, you answered the question, but uh, maybe we can uh, um, revisit a little bit the, the maybe the tactics of the IOC to define itself. And uh, the student's question was, uh, what do you think will happen to the Olympic movement if there is a political litmus test for participating in each Olympic games and who should make these decisions? And it looks mm -hmm. like the Olympic committee is sort of going back and forth to the UN, identifying with it, relying with it, but also kind of diverging if it needs to. And that the vocabulary that the committee has always been using since the beginning is of these superlative abstractions of human development, human dignity, freedom. It's basically the Enlightenment project uh, uh, kind of revamping itself every three, four decades. And I always, my concept of the class is not so much that I teach the history of the games themselves, but the history of the development of the last 150 years. Uh, and the major topics that are keep coming up. And it seems to me that the committee is, um, well, the, the movement, I, sh I should say, not the committee because it's a different uh, aspect of the whole picture, is that it employs these vague superlative terms that uh, uh, resist any kind of definition and therefore can allow for all sorts of uh, variations in policy, but also in some ways uh, for it to be vulnerable to criticism for which it may not be entirely responsible for. And so there's this sort of doubleness there, I guess, in all its manifestations, in that sometimes the NGOs are using the Olympic movement's own rhetoric to affect change. Now, I'm not quite sure if they will ever come to an agreement what human dignity is, but um, it sounds like a very inspiring concept, right? It's just a problem of how each culture comes to define it. But um, what are maybe some final words on how the movement might move on or not? Because I have read you know, opinions out there that say, maybe we should just stop the Olympics. What's the whole point of this charade of internationalism? What do you guys make of this most extreme uh, statement that um, maybe we should do away with this and just focus on championships, world championships? I don't think we will do away with it because really powerful people and organizations and corporations really want them to happen because they serve so many interests of, mm -hmm. of these governments, host cities, um, mayors, national um, heads of state, CEOs of corporations. Really, it's the CEOs of corporations, in my opinion, that are sort of driving the continued growth of the Olympic Games. I mean, um, you know, in Beijing, there were about 100 national heads of state that were present for the opening ceremonies. Um, and that's probably a record setting number. Mm -hmm. But the estimated number of CEOs of major corporations that were there for the opening ceremonies was about 1,000 or more. Wow. <laughs> so this is something going on behind the scenes that your average fan isn't aware of. And, and I think as long as people with that kind of power and wealth want them to happen, they will happen. Bill, any final closing comments? Uh, no, but uh, actually the question at the very beginning about why why not the, the, the youth Olympic games, I mean, obviously we can't handle everything in the session, but it does raise the question of, 
thinking beyond the box and imagining, you know, there are proposals to have a permanent Olympic site to avoid this question of hosting. But there are other ways of thinking about Olympic futures that are probably beyond the entrenched interests of the IOC itself. But you have, you know, they have succeeded in putting together a portfolio of, of games and game organizations, youth, world, uh, masters, um, the Olympics, the Paralympics. You know, one can imagine something other than the crude distinction between a winter and a summer Olympics. And mm -hmm. you know, one can imagine clusters of, of the 33 sports. And it's hard to logistically to put on. Uh, one can imagine clusters of sports so every year, um, field sports or, or aquatic sports that would, that would reconfigure and have youth games, the, the Olympics themselves, the Masters, the Paralympics in those sports maybe at the same time. Um, so I, you know, I think without acknowledging the problems and the problems and the, the interest, particularly the corporate interest, may, uh, may pull the plug on the current model. Um, but I think there are also some ways of, of reconfiguring world sporting events and championships um, that uh, might be better adapted to those four pillars um, of, the, of, of the current Olympic Charter. I think the idea of uh, multiple uh, host cities is a very intriguing one. Maybe we will get an African uh, Olympics uh, this way. And mm -hmm. also considering that many countries are landlocked, this may give them the chance to at least host some of the events, but not all of them. Or you can distribute mm -hmm. events that are uh, geographically more amenable to some countries and uh, uh, quite forbidding to others. So I, th I think the multiple cities uh, um, idea for me is the one with the most uh, of future at least and it serves a little bit more egalitarian uh, so that we don't get these clusters it's going to be always Australia uh, South, uh, East Asia and Europe and America uh, North America particular right maybe uh, once every 50 years a Central American city and that's it but I think that multiple cities offers us many more uh, opportunities that's one one uh, way of thinking of. Otherwise, we go back to Olympia because the area around Olympia is in fact quite undeveloped. There's lots of space for facilities. Question is, who will pay for it? It's a gorgeous place to be there anyway. But uh, John, any final comments? Yeah. Oh, um, I, well, several, but uh, just to focus um, on, I mean, I think that the situation is so different. I mean, the pandemic, is changing the way people are thinking about things. And we still don't know where it's going to end. I mean, we, we are fortunate to live in countries with uh, vaccine programs. I mean, Bill pointed out the, the bizarre situation in Japan where they've got lots of vaccine, but they're not rolling it out. Mm. And, you know, the, 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 the reason why it could be a super spreader is the way in which if they go ahead with it, it could impact on the Japanese population, which is in a way my concern specifically yeah. about this particular Olympics. Um, but, you know, there's also the issue of equity. You know, there are lots of countries in the world, many countries that want to send their athletes who haven't got access to this, uh, you know, the vaccine, who maybe they can't take part, or if they can, they're going to come, you know, into problems of creating mutual um, what are they called? The mutant uh, strains, you know, the new strains. So there's a very specific issue about this particular Olympics. And I, I've been, I, be, I get a, a little bit distressed about the fact that athletes are seen as very special people. There's 11,000 of them would go for the Summer Olympics. I think they should just accept that they should take the hit this time. And uh, maybe that's the, why somebody asked the question, how can this change? How can the narrative change? It can probably only change if athletes start to say they are worried about taking part. They don't want to jeopardize other people's health. The trouble is most athletes are just thinking about competing in their, in their sport and their, their championship. And so there's a, there's a real problem there. But I mean, I, I really don't know whether we're going to see an Olympics this year or not. It could be you know, next month we'll hear some devastating development. I mean, Tokyo, sorry, in Japan, 
uh, sometimes the you know the, the numbers, the figures go up and spike. I'm routinely getting information from my university warning students not to engage in any kind of social activity whatsoever, to eat on their own, to go home and not talk to their friends. So it's a very strange environment for an Olympic festival of sport and internationalism to take place. And this is, this is where I, you know, I have problems about this particular Olympics. I'm not an Olympic uh, phobe. I'm not necessarily an Olympophile. But I, I uh, you know, I, I'm concerned about Tokyo 2020. Mm. Well, thank you, everybody, for your um, for your uh, comments. And there is a couple of comments that we're, we're unfortunately not going to be able to respond to because we have run over time. But uh, they are addressed to the speakers, and I think you should take a look at them. And uh, thanks uh, to our audience for attending and following us today. Uh, you've been most generous. And um, thank you to the three distinguished speakers here that have uh, made this event, this wonderful conversation that we have been having for the last two hours. Um, so goodbye to everybody. And if the speakers would like to hang around a little bit more, we can catch up off uh, the official time. Thank you, George.